how he lives, you ought to find out. Yes, sir. Once again tonight in the book of Jonah in chapter 1. I noticed last week that some of us had a little difficulty finding him. Let me see if I can't help you. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. J A O J. Oh, J A O J. You ought to be able to find that. Jesus said that there will be a sign as Jesus or as, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days. If you can figure out three quarters, open your Bible about three quarters of the way through and you'll come right to the book of Jonah. If that don't help you, <laughs> Genesis, Exodus, <laughs> Oh my. Jonah chapter 1. I want to read a little bit with you tonight. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God, if so be that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said every one to his fellows, Come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and the lots fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us, what is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country, and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am in Hebrew, and I fear the Lord the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wrought and was tempestuous. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this great tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea wrought and was tempestuous against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for, though, for thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. So they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. 
When Jonah went down to Joppa seeking to buy a ticket on a ship going to Tarshish, he had no idea what lay in front of him. He thought, I'll just get away from here. I'll just go in another direction than that which God has declared that I should go. I'll do it my way rather than God's way. But I want you to understand that even before Jonah paid for the ticket, God had already prepared a storm. This was not something that just blew up out of the Mediterranean. It's not some sort of low pressure center that suddenly popped up. But this is all under the direction of God. For God was looking at his man. God was looking after his man. And God was going to chasten his man in order to get the job done that he had originally assigned to his man. When Jonah was still standing on the dock, he was already headed into the storm, going into the face of the chastening of God. May I stop there long enough to say to you that any time you get away from God, any time you backslide on God, any time you run from God, the only way back is under the lash of God. And I want to tell you, you don't want to get under the lash of God. You need to get right, stay right, and be right at all times. Show you what I mean. There was a man that I knew many years ago, a senior in college, like two hours to graduate, married with one little girl. Apparently his wife had been nagging him, but anyway, he came to the people with whom I was employed at the time and made application for a job. And this is what he said. I thought I wanted to be a preacher. I was preparing to do that. But my wife and family have done without long enough. And I'm going to get me a job so I can buy her a a car and I can get us a house and I can get her and my baby some new clothes and I'm going to forget about where I was going. I'm going to take care of my family. They hired him. They bragged about that to the rest of the employees. He got a job. He was out to make money. He bought a new house. He bought a new car. He bought new clothes. And in six months, his wife took them all and left. And he had nothing left. He was headed into the storm. The minute that he said, I'm going to do it my way. I'm not following God any longer. I'm not going to be under his direction. I'm going to do it my way. Let me show you what I mean. She was a beautiful young girl. A high school senior. She was one of the loveliest young people I've ever known in my life. Looked like a model. Beautiful auburn colored hair. Looked like it every time you saw her. She just stepped off of a magazine cover. She was that kind of a, a beautiful girl with a winsome spirit about her. Came from a good family active in the church. One day, though, her daddy came home from work unexpectedly, and when he did, he found her and two or three or four others in the basement of their home smoking dope. Well, he had what I guess a good daddy would do. He just pitched a fit, and he throwed all of them out except his daughter. Well, the next day, those young people at the high school got together and took up an offering and gave her the money to buy a ticket so she could run away from home. And run she did. They later found her, brought her back home, but it wasn't long until she was gone again. Her life was wrecked. 
Her beauty began to fade. Her winsomeness was gone. And within just a matter of a short time, she is not the kind of person that you'd want your son to bring home to meet mama. Before she ever laid out of school, before she ever invited those kids into her basement, before they ever lit up the first marijuana cigarette, they were already headed into the storm. Let me show you what I mean. They were active, faithful family. He was a deacon. His wife was active in the other activities of the church. Good family, large family. Everything seemed to be going well for them. But then I noticed they began to get a little slack. I want you to know the preacher knows when you're in church. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Let me tell you something, folks. If you see me on a Sunday morning scanning the crowd, I'm not looking to see who's here. I'm looking to see who's not here. I know where you sit. I said to one of our folks the other day, you moved on me. They said, we did, and we didn't know if you'd catch us or not. And folks, I want to tell you right now, I know my people. I know my sheep. And when you're here, I know it. When you're not here, I know it. I noticed they began to get a little slack. Attitude changed. She got sick, went to the doctor. And she came back and called me on the phone and said, Preacher, the doctor says that I've got some problems that I've got to deal with and I'm under too much stress. And he says that I need to cut back on some things. And so I want you to know that we're dropping out of church. I said, why don't you quit on all of those clubs that you're in? Why don't you quit running after all the socialites of the town? Why don't you cut back in those areas? Well, we could, preacher, but that's important to us in our family life and in our business world. So we're just giving up all of our jobs and we're dropping out of church. Well, if I had time to describe to you the story of that family over the next years, you would understand that before she ever picked up the phone to call her pastor, they were already headed into the storm. You don't run from God. You don't quit on God. You don't back up on God that you're not headed into the storm. There's a passage of scripture in the book of Acts that is most interesting for the people. The Bible says that Paul, who is on his way to Rome as a prisoner, they have stopped at a place called the Fair Havens. And then the captain of the ship said, we need to continue on our journey. But God's spirit said to Paul, tell him not to go. But the Bible says, and when the south winds blew softly, oh, it looked good. Oh, it seemed like it was just the thing to do. It seemed like that this was just going to be a casual little sailing trip from one island to another. But what they didn't know was out beyond that island's safety and that harbor, there was a storm about to blow in on them. And when God, through his man or through his word, says, you'd better watch out, there's a storm out there, you'd better lay anchor in the harbor. They did not, and they lost it all. They sailed into the storm. Now, I want you to notice several things about this. Notice, first of all, in verse 4, that this was a prepared storm. This was not a natural occurrence. Now, there are all kinds of storms. The Bible tells us that the winds, just like the rivers, have courses that they flow in. And that those courses may bend a little bit, but they have courses that they flow in. Science is learning the truth of that in our day. How that the winds have their courses. That's the reason that some of these who study weather patterns and, and they're able to predict years in advance how many storms there are going to be and where those storms are going to occur because they've learned to read that when it happens here and the temperature is yonder and all those other things have an effect that they know where the winds are going to blow. And we're already told how many hurricanes that we can expect in this year. And uh, we already see another one now developing. And it started not off of the coast of the Carolinas. It may hit us before it's done. But it started over on the continent of Africa and finding its way out into 
the ocean. This was a prepared storm. God put into motion the things that needed to be in order to put that storm in the right place so that that ship that left its harbor with no idea what lay in front of it would sail straight into a storm prepared by the Lord. And folks, when you start running from God, when you get away from God, when you back up on God, Somewhere down the road, it may start with just a gentle breeze and you'll just say, my, isn't this nice? But then the next thing you know, it becomes a full gale. And then you're fighting for your very life because God in his love for you has prepared a storm not to destroy you, but to save you. A prepared storm. Secondly, it was a pounding storm. Look at verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God and they cast forth wares into the ship in order to, or into the sea in order to lighten the load that somehow they might be able to survive the storm. Now here's a ship at sea and it's got a full load. It's riding low in the water. And the winds begin to blow and because it's riding so low, the waves not only are pounding against it, but the waves are coming over the top of it. And these guys are working with all of their strength and all of their skills and at every command of the captain doing everything they can to somehow save the ship and in doing so to save their lives. Notice that it produced fear. Now folks, I don't know if you've ever truly been afraid or not. But there's some things in life that are just absolutely scare you to death. And these men were afraid. Now these men were seasoned sailors. They'd been in storms before. They'd done everything that they knew to do just as they had before. But something's different about this storm. And they are afraid. They're afraid. But I'll tell you what you ought to be afraid of more than anything else. You ought to be afraid of missing God. You ought to be afraid of God taking his hand off of you. You ought to be afraid that you'd wake up one morning and God was gone. You remember a man? The strongest man in history, no doubt. A man by the name of Samson. You remember the story? How that Samson broke the commands of God. He did things that he uh, was not supposed to do because of his Ninevite vow or his Nazarite vow. And as he did those things, he went down and he partook of, of, the, uh, of, of wine or at least he was in the midst of the grapes which he was never to do. He uh, laid his head in the lap of a woman that was not the woman chosen for him by the Lord. He killed an animal and a, a, a Nazarite was never to touch the carcass of a dead animal and yet he comes back you remember the story and finds honey in the old carcass of that lion and gets it out and he begins to break the vow what he's saying is you see Samson was strong, Samson was mighty, Samson knew the strength and blessing of God but Samson began to look at and lust after things that he should never been involved with and one by one when he finally gave himself over to Bathsheba, she began to look for ways to, to trick him and find the source of his strength. And the Bible says, he said, if you'll just tie me with, with new rope, that'll do it. But he jumped up, the Bible says, and shook himself, snapped those ropes like they were nothing but twine. Again, he said, weave my hair into a weaver's beam and that'll take away my strength. But the Bible says that he got up and shook himself and, and, and went out and fought and beat the Philistines. But then he said, cut off my hair. And when she cut off his hair, and woke him up from his sleep. The Bible says that Samson stood up and shook himself as before, not knowing that the spirit was departed from him. That to me is one of the saddest pictures in all of the word of God. Samson, the mighty man that scared the enemy to death, 
now shaking himself as though he would knock him away only to find that he's just nothing. He's lost his power. Have you ever had God's hand on you and lose it? I live under the awareness that I'm nothing without God. I have no message lest God gives me one. I cannot preach without God's anointing upon my life. Years ago before I became pastor of this church, the devil began to lie to me. Did you know the devil is a liar? Did you know that he'll whisper to you when you don't even know he's whispering? I don't know how he gets in. We were talking about it this morning uh, after the service and in the, in the office with the deacons and uh, about how the devil gets after you. And uh, by the way, reach up right here on your shoulder, on your left shoulder. Just reach up and, and feel. Do you have a knot up there? I'm right over the top of your shoulder. Do you have a knot there? You feel that? You know what that is? That's the devil's knot. <laughs> That's where that rascal sits up there on your shoulder and tells you all those bad things that you ought to do. But if you'll feel over on the other side, there's one over there, that's the angel's knot. You listen to that guy instead of this one over here, all right? And so uh, the devil began to lie to me, tell me how sorry I was. I mean, it was a church. They loved me. They took care of me. They paid me more than I was worth. And they, they just all time doing good things for me. But man, I'd get up and I'd preach loud and long and they didn't care how much I preached or how loud I preached. If I spit and sweat and stomped, I was all right with them. But they didn't want me to ask them to do anything. I'd go off in a revival meeting and man, we'd have people saved. I'd come back to that same old crowd sitting there like moon-eyed lovers looking at me. One woman in the church knew exactly how long the crack was in the wall and she could tell you if it had grown by a centimeter or not from one week to the other. In two years, she never looked at me while I preached, but she enjoyed studying that crack in the wall. And the devil said... God's through with you. God's not going to ever use you again. God's not going to bless your life. You're a has-been. God ain't ever going to bless you again. You know what? I believed it. I began to think, dear Lord, after all this time, I've come to this point and God's just going to put me on the shelf. You know, the, the apostle said, God forbid that after I have preached to others that I would become a castaway. A castaway is something that's thrown out on the trash pile. Just a rust. It's a relic. It's, it's unusable. And I said, that's where I am. And I began to pray. I fasted for days. I prayed. I read the word of God. I prayed. I cried. I crawled around on the floor in my office. I wasn't fit for God nor man. And here's what I got to. I said, God, if you're not going to bless me, if you're not going to use me, then just turn me over to the devil and let him kill me because I don't want to live like this anymore. I was in a storm and that storm was about to drag me down. It was about to kill me. It was a pounding storm upon my life. But I remember that day when God came again. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that God don't leave? And God will come again. And when God came that day, oh, what a wonder it was when God reached down and picked me up. A pounding storm. It produced fear in the lives of these men. Not only did it produce fear, but it produced a loss of wares. Now, I don't know what that ship was carrying, but whatever it was, they began to throw it overboard. Can you imagine that here is a box that contains China ware that some woman in another country has purchased and now is going to get that. And in the midst of that storm, she's never going to get that China because they chunk it over the side. Over here is wares of grain that they're going to distribute to some other country that they're depending on that grain to feed their hungry. But they're never going to get it for I can see them as they take the sacks and throw them over one by one. Over here and they just take one thing after another and throw the lading of the ship over the side. Everything that's thrown over, the men who owned it are losing. 
Everything that's thrown over, the people who are going to buy it are losing. You can't run from God, folks, and, and, and not affect other people's lives. When you're in the storm, you're causing others to suffer. Can some of you mamas and daddies here tonight say, I understand that, for it's my son, it's my daughter that's in the storm, but I've paid the price. I've paid the price. It was a pounding storm. And it produced a great labor. Can you see these men? Their muscles are strained to the point that they are fatigued almost to the place that they're just ready to give up. And they're crying out to their gods. Did you notice, my brothers and sisters, that these men are pagans. This storm is a pounding storm, but it's also a purifying storm. Look at verses 8 through 10. And they said, Tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? What are your people? Notice that he said, I am a Hebrew. I fear Jehovah God who created both the water and the dry land. Now folks, this storm is revealing. Jonah was trying to hide. He didn't want anybody to know who he was. Now they're saying, who are you? And here's what he said. Now it's not written in the Bible there. He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> now folks, there's a lot of things you want on a ship, but a Baptist preacher in the midst of a storm ain't one of them. <laughs> Especially if they get as sick at sea as I do. <laughs> Who are you? I'm a Hebrew. The word Hebrew automatically put into the hearts of those men on that boat an understanding that this man is one of those who are the chosen of God. He is one of those who have been set apart and he was given a mission by the Lord. The Bible tells us that he told him exactly why he was, why he was there. He was on a mission from God and he ran from that mission and they said, why in the world have you done this? I'll tell you, there's nothing sorrier than a preacher who has gotten away from God. Oh, by the way, that fits for deacons and Sunday school teachers and anybody else who names the name of Jesus. I am a Hebrew and I serve Jehovah God. These are pagans. Here's a man who's being forced into witnessing. He didn't come out there with a King James Version and say, let me show you how the, you can know God. He didn't pull out a track and say, let me tell you the way that you can find the Lord. He didn't tell them about the spiritual laws. He didn't relate to them how they can have a full and meaningful life. He didn't tell them about faith and how they can find the Lord God. He just had to, he was being forced into revealing who he is. Now I'll tell you what, sometimes God will put you in a place to where you have to tell who you are. I think I may have told you, some of you. I was down in Jamaica years ago and we were invited to a church, another denomination, for a youth meeting. And I was to preach that night. And so they sent another preacher along with me to that meeting. Had some of the best fried chicken I've ever eaten in my life. They eat chicken everywhere when preacher comes. And so they had it set and we, I mean the building was full. And then when the meal was over, a bunch of kids started coming around putting some of those funny glasses on the table. You know what I'm talking about? Now over at our house we drank tea and we got glasses. But after we had finished with our tea, they brought some glasses out there that didn't have but one leg. Stand up, you know, on one leg, those tall, spindly things. Now, I know what that meant. <laughs> Where I come from, folks, I know what that kind of glass means. And then I saw them coming with some dark colored bottles, and I said, oh, oh, what have I got into tonight? 
I said to my preacher friend, they're serving champagne. What are you going to do? He said, I'm going to pretend that I drink it, but I'm not going to drink it. What are you going to do? I said, I ain't going to drink it. He said, you, you, you might offend them. I ain't going to drink it. I turned my glass upside down. And then God just got all over me. You know, sometimes God will just put you in a place that you can't keep quiet. And there they are pouring. Bleep, 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 and peeling up all those glasses. And I stood up and, the, and the, head, the, I don't know who he was, youth director or something. He got up and lifted his glass, fixing to make a toast. And I said, sir, where I come from, we're teetotalers. We don't believe in drinking alcoholic beverage. And I want you to know I've come to preach and I'm not participating in your drinking. Oh, dear God. It created a storm. But there are times when you just have to stand up. Times when you just have to speak out. They let me preach anyhow. And preach I did. Bunch of those kids got saved that night. But I just thought, what if I'd have just pretended? Oh my soul, listen. God said to Jonah, I've got a message for you to deliver. And if you won't deliver it, over in Tarshish, I'm going to fix it so you'll have to tell them out there in the midst of the ocean. And so he said, I'm a preacher and I believe in God. Now I want you to notice these are pagans. They weren't ready to hear that. As a matter of fact, they were so afraid of hearing that that they said, oh God, we're under judgment because of this guy. We got to get rid of him to purify and storm and they said we just need to settle it once and for all by the way if you didn't read it before or see it before please look at verse 14 these are pagans who got saved Jonah just preached and said I'm a Hebrew I believe in God the creator they did everything they could from, to keep from believing him. Notice the Bible says they were exceeding afraid. That means their knees were knocking together. And then the Bible says that they, he said, throw me overboard, but they didn't throw him overboard. The Bible says that they worked the harder trying to roll that boat to shore. They didn't want to accept the message, but Jonah again said, throw me in and the sea will be calm. Verse 14, wherefore they cried, the word cried there means they prayed. Who? Not to these other little letter gods, but they prayed unto the Lord. And they said, we beg you, we beg you, O Lord. Don't hold this man's life against us because we're going to chunk him overboard. <laughs> they got right. They acknowledged that there is but one God. Now listen, folks, if you're in a storm and trying to find your way back to God, if you're in a situation where God's put you that you've got to witness, you at least know that you're going to get somebody else to God in the midst of the storm. A purifying storm for the crew. It was a purifying storm for the captain. And it was a purifying storm for Jonah. For please note in verse 12, Jonah says, it's for my sake that this tempest upon you. And again in verse 15, the Bible says, they threw him into the sea and the sea ceased her raging. Immediately. Did you catch that? It didn't blow for another day or two. They threw him overboard and immediately the sea was calm. What is the message? Just this. My friend, as long as there's sin in your life, there's going to be a raging sea in your world. But the minute you get sin out of your life, the sea will calm. As you know, I took a few days, my wife and I, 
We left on Thursday morning, drove up to the mountains and spent some time with friends up there in the mountains. Got to meet several of the preachers. And the topic of conversation on Friday night was about another pastor that these folks knew and had been in their church and, and sung in his church and so on. Thought a lot of him. And one of the guys came and said, Did you hear they ran him off last Sunday? ran him off. Why, I thought everything was going good. And they just talked about the man and his church and how good things was. And then he said, yeah, he preached on Baptist doctrine. And by the time the service was over, some of the women of the church had gone on to him. And they were mad. And one of the men was ready to punch him in the face. And they just voted him out. Because he preached on doctrine Baptist doctrine in a Baptist church now what does that say to you it says they had a bunch of people in there that didn't believe the Bible it says they had a bunch of people in that church who had sin in their life it says that they were practicing things contrary to the word of God and when the man of God preached the word of God conviction from God got all over them and they, and they hit the man of God rather than hitting the altar like they should have done but when you get sin out of the camp ask Joshua he can tell you what happens when you get sin in the camp Ask those men that they drug back from the battlefield dead because there was sin in the camp. Ask those wives, those widows and children who were weeping because their husband, their daddy had been killed because there was sin in the camp. And folks, I want you to know tonight I shudder. I try to warn young people. I try to warn all of my people that the quickest way into a storm is to take one step away from God. Allow the devil an inch in your life and he'll wreck and he'll ruin your world. And if you're in the storm, if the winds are raging, if the sea is tempestuous against you, just admit why it's going on. And get to where God is so that he can bless you and restore you. Are you in a storm? Do you know how you got there? The way out is to turn to God. Let's pray.